My name is Thad Darger. I'm a, a former F-117 pilot, spent 11 years in the Air Force, and uh, I'm very fortunate to be at the Air Zoo today so that I can give a presentation later on tonight about this beautiful airplane. So I come from a, uh, a long line of people that were in the military. I have a grandfather that was in, served in World War II, and my father was a Marine Corps helicopter pilot in Vietnam. And uh, growing up, my dad used to always talk to me about the military and military academies. And so following high school, I ended up going to the Air Force Academy and spent four years at Air Force. And uh, when I left, I went to pilot training in Lubbock, Texas. I ended up getting uh, very fortunate uh, to, to get my first uh, choice out of pilot training, which was a B-1. I was in um, the first couple of years where people came straight out of pilot training and into the airplane because the, the airplane was still relatively new. And I ended up flying B-1s for about four years. Uh, I became a T-38 instructor pilot and spent a couple of years at Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma, uh, flying T-38s and teaching new pilots. And then I was picked up in a um, very unusual pro uh, program that was called the Fighter Bomber Crossflow. I applied to that as a B-1 pilot and became one of four uh, B-1 pilots that were accepted to transition into a fighter. And the fighter that I was given was the South Fighter, uh, along with another, uh, a, a guy that ended up being a very good friend of mine, another B-1 pilot. And so then I spent uh, from 1997 until 2000 flying the F-117. Well, first of all, when I applied um, for my fighters in that program, I didn't write 117 on the list. And I actually received a call from the Pentagon when I was at Vance. And somebody called me up and they said, hey, you didn't put a, a stealth fighter on your fighter dream sheet or the list of fighters that you listed. You know, if we gave you one, would you fly it? And I said, well, I didn't even know that was an option. Um, so when you talk about the transition into the airplane, um, ironically, the first thing that I had to do was go back to IFF, Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals, which is a, a, a roughly six month program that all pilots um, went to back then after pilot training, and it was to give you the basics of fighter fundamentals. And I had to go through that program and then uh, showed up at Holloman and started going through the stealth program. And, you know, one of the, the questions that I get the most is how different is it flying a stealth fighter? And I would say that it's not that much different, meaning it flies like an airplane, even though it doesn't look like an airplane. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I was uh, this other gentleman that went with me, Ken Tatum. He actually flew these into retirement in 2008. We were the only two bomber pilots that ever went to the aircraft. And uh, I always joke around because you obviously know the answer to this. Uh, it is a bomber. It carries only two bombs. Um, but the whole idea of having it uh, designated as a stealth fighter you know, the, the story goes that when it was secret for a very long time, they were bringing in the best single seat fighter pilots on the planet, and they didn't want to tell them that they were going to fly a B-117. Um, and so I kind of get why they did that. But the other thing that I would say about it is it's definitely a bomber. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, if we were to, if we would have designated it as a bomber, it would have been the only single seat uh, bomber really that had ever been made. And so, um, I guess that's a kind of a wishy-washy way of saying, I'm not sure if it should have been designated as an F, an A, or a B, um, but I can get down with the F-117. It was really ironic because I don't think I'd ever seen a stealth fighter in my life until I found out that I had received one in that program, and then one flew into the air show that we had at Vance Air Force Base where I was flying T-38s. And so I actually have a picture of me standing in front of one uh, with some very, very young kids, obviously, uh, in 1995, and it was the first time I'd ever seen it. And um, it was striking, uh, to say the least. It is a, a very, very unique airplane from its looks, as far as you know. There are a million things that are unique about a stealth fighter, but one of the really unique things about it is there were never any two-seat uh, stealth fighters uh, built, so it's just like an A-10. And so what we did, the part of the training process, is we did multiple hours in a simulator, going over everything from normal flight ops to emergency procedures and everything else. And the first time when you go out and you pull out onto the runway in a stealth fighter and you realize that you've just taken off, it is a surreal experience, trust me. Um, but again, because of its flight characteristics and the computers and, and fly-by-wire um, systems in the F-117, uh, it was just a really easy experience. It felt exactly like what I'd been doing in the simulators. And it's funny, I've been asked questions before about the fact that it doesn't have afterburning engines and that the wings are swept back. And, you know, it does have a very long takeoff roll and it has a very, very long landing roll, right? We were one of the only aircrafts that used a chute to slow us down because of how fast we would be going when we landed. 
But as far as flying the aircraft, flying in the pattern at an Air Force base, it would fly the exact same ground track as a T-38, which is a very maneuverable aircraft, obviously, or an F-16. And so my, I don't want to call it a generic answer, but the flight characteristics or the handling of an F-117, even though it was all fly-by-wire, and even though it doesn't look like it, it flew very much like a T-38 or a B-1 for that matter. So I do know that I finished with over 600 hours in the aircraft. Uh, I flew it for roughly three years, um, from the, the summer of 97 until the, the summer of 2000. And I, I flew somewhere around uh, 10 to 15 combat missions. Um, one of the things that was very difficult during Operation Allied Force and the con conflict in Yugoslavia and Kosovo was that occurred in the spring and the weather was not ideal, meaning the 117 couldn't see through cloud cover. It needed uh, a clear line of sight for us to be able to deliver our weapons. So out of those roughly 15 um, combat sorties that I flew, I only uh, dropped the bombs on half of them, seven or eight missions. Um, there was so much in interest in the air airplane that whenever I was fortunate enough to take it to an air show or fly it in an air show, um, it was amazing uh, the number of people that would come up and ask questions about the airplane. In fact, people still do today um, when I talk to them. Um, but it really is a piece of aviation history, and it was an absolute honor to be involved with it. And so the interest was obviously very high. And um, when, when we flew those combat sorties over Yugoslavia in 1999, it was really only the, the second time it had been used in a lot of combat since 1991 in the first Gulf War. So like I said, it was uh, lots of public interest and, and an absolute honor to fly it. I had 100% uh, complete faith uh, in the math and, and the airplane and the design. And it's ironic because as you know, um, when I was flying the aircraft, the one that I flew from New Mexico almost 14 hours in the air to Italy uh, was shot down on the fifth night of the war. And people always ask how that affected us. And I tell people all the time, and the two of us discussed this last night, the F-117 was never invisible. Um, no one ever said it was invisible. It's a low observable airplane and we know that it was roughly a thousandth of a meter on its radar cross-section. Um, but after we lost the first one, um, it obviously showed that we weren't invincible. And it showed that war is a very dangerous thing. And, and so I would say that I didn't fly a combat mission until after that loss had occurred, um, but I had complete faith in the airplane. The, the first combat mission I flew following the loss of that aircraft, I was not concerned about the technology in, in, in one way, shape, or form. There were, there were three different things in my mind that came together when we lost that aircraft, and there's been a lot of things written about it. One of them was complacency. We were, um, for lack of a better word, kind of doing the same thing every night as far as how we entered the country, and um, you know, there was some human, meaning human intelligence, um, supposedly at the base where we're taking off at Italy, where people were calling back and saying, oh, they're taking off at this time, so they're probably gonna be in country at roughly this time. And so, um, again, back to the three things, um, people always talk about the complacency uh, or, or the predictability of some of the things that we were doing, um, but at the same time, uh, the modification that the Serbians had done to one of their radars um, uh, played into it. Um, and the other thing that plays into a lot of things in, in life is luck and uh, they happen to be looking in the exact right place at the exact right time um, as, as Colonel Zelko was opening his bomb base to deliver his ordinance. And so when you put those three things together, the complacency, the improvements in their radar, and then that luck, uh, it can lead to a disaster like the one that happened on that night. You know, there, there were so many uh, great things that I was able to do in it. Um, I'll tell you the most memorable experiences were, were uh, number one, that first combat mission that I flew. Um, because again, it was after we had lost the aircraft, so, so we knew that it was possible. Um, the first flight in the aircraft, or the, my first flight that you had asked me about earlier, was obviously a very memorable experience. And then I would say that um, educating people on the airplane and being at air shows and flying at air shows and having just crowds of people come up and stand outside of ropes um, uh, to ask questions and to learn more about the airplane, um, it really made it feel special. Thank you. I would say that the thing that uh, I tell people about the most that they might not know about is that when we flew the airplane 99% um, of the time, particularly when we flew it stateside, um, there were radar reflectors, we call them pimples, that were bolted onto both sides of the airplane that were meant to reflect radar energy so that air traffic control could see us. 
Um, I always tell people that if back in the day, if you ever saw a stealth fighter without those on the side, and they weren't particularly large, they were probably only about a foot and a half long. Um, but if you saw a stealth fighter without those radar reflectors on it, then that meant something. Um, because the only time that they were flown like that back then is when it was some kind of a combat situation. Well, it's really special to be reunited with Shaba. And uh, because I always loved the nose art and the design, I actually took pictures uh, back in the 90s with this particular aircraft. And then when I went back in my logbooks and, and saw that I'd flown the aircraft not only in combat in Yugoslavia, um, but I'd also flown it um, in Kuwait when I was on a deployment to Kuwait in 1998. And then at various other times uh, during my, my three-year career in the stealth fighter, uh, it's really special. It was an 8th Fighter Squadron jet, and I was in the 8th Fighter Squadron the entire time that I was with the airplane. I, the restoration effort that was performed by Dick Class and all of the volunteers here at the Air Zoo is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I saw a restored uh, F-117 at the Dayton Air Museum. It was probably 10 or 12 years ago. And I'm not even sure exactly what that one looked like because when I came in and saw Shaba and the work that Dick and his team had done here at the Air Zoo, it blew me away. Uh, it looks perfect and absolutely stunning. I've been very fortunate in my life. I've done some really cool things, but at the same time, I'm just a guy, I'm just a man that grew up in you know, Sioux Falls, South Dakota and, and led a normal life. And so to be here or to be anywhere and to see an aircraft like this and to know that, that I was fortunate enough uh, to fly this is, uh, is a very, very special thing for me.